Mount Fuji, Japan's most famous landmark, stands at 3,776.24 meters above sea level and inspired many artists, poets, and also climbers with its perfect symmetrical shape and snow covered top over the last few centuries. I was one of them in 2014 when I decided to summit the mountain. However, with climbing it also came some difficulties. And that's why in today's video, I wanted to share the five mistakes I did the first time I climbed Mount Fuji so that you can avoid them. If you're new to this channel, my name is Adam. I currently live in Tokyo, Japan, and I've been doing different videos on hiking, on traveling, as well as photography in Japan. Currently, I'm mostly focusing on hiking as traveling due to COVID is not really possible. And yeah, I've been doing these kind of cinematic hikes out of Tokyo. Now the issue with that right now is that it's peak rainy season. So if you look at the weather forecast for one week, it means that uh, it's going to be essentially rainy or cloudy every day, which means that I cannot really go out um, because there's mudslides. If you've seen the news footage in Kyushu recently, where around 60 people have died due to the floodings. Yeah, it's that kind of situation right now. But I still wanted to do kind of a hiking related video. And that's why I thought today I will talk about time that I climbed Mount Fuji and some of the things I learned from that. I first and also for the only time climbed Mount Fuji back in 2014, which was also my first trip to Japan. I was at the time a very inexperienced traveler and an even more inexperienced hiker. I would say Mount Fuji was probably the first real mountain that I climbed and it was kind of a well, tough choice to some degree for the first mountain because Mount Fuji is at around 3,780 meters or around I think 12,000 feet the tallest mountain in Japan and yeah it was quite a feat honestly to do it um, as a really as a beginner. Now we did it in a group of five people very international from the US, Korea, Japan, Germany and me from Austria and we did it as a two-day hike with an overnight stay in one of the mountain huts which is something that I may or may not recommend that's gonna be in one of the mistakes a bit later on. But yeah, with that said, let's jump right into mistake number one, which is related to footwear and shoes. As a beginner hiker, I thought that for hiking, you would really need heavy hiking boots because they give you stability. They allow you to climb more easily over rocks. They allow you to not slip. They give ankle support and all of the stuff that is usually associated with hiking boots. And yeah, they were really sturdy. I didn't slip or anything. It felt really safe walking. But one issue with the shoes or with hiking boots specifically is they are very heavy and Mount Fuji is not a particularly difficult mountain to hike. It is a long hike, but a lot of the hiking just involves basically stepping up over like rock steps until you reach the top. And the issue with that is that if you have heavy hiking boots on your feet, every step you take you kind of carry the extra weight, the boots on your feet up and it kind of really adds up over a I don't know, 10 hour hike overall. <laughs> It really really adds up and I honestly by the fifth hour I wish that I just I could just take off the shoes and walk barefoot because it was so uh, annoying having to lift my heavy foot every time I took a step. So what I would recommend instead if it isn't too rainy you can check the weather forecast. Fuji is kind of changing weather pretty quickly so it might still rain but what I would recommend is have it bringing maybe some trail runners or what I recently bought are shoes like this. This is kind of, I'd say, it's also hiking shoes. So they have some really nice profile to make sure that you don't slip. But on the top, they're more like lightweight. Um, they are really like airflow. They let, let, let a lot of air through. And the good thing about these shoes is that they're lightweight. Like these, I think, are maybe like 400 grams or something, which is really, really light. And it certainly helps when you're doing hikes where you just do a lot of stepping as Mount Fuji is. So that was my mistake number one, is bringing heavy hiking boots. Mistake number two is also related to clothing. And while I'd say that I overprepared on the shoe side, I would say I was kind of underprepared on the clothing side. So Mount Fuji, the climbing season, I forgot to mention it, but the climbing season of Mount Fuji is open between June and September, which are the mostly summer months in Japan. June right now is unfortunately the rainy season. But definitely August and all the way to September even, it has like 30 degrees plus Celsius every day, which is really hot. That's on the ground though, but as I said, Mount Fuji at around 12,000 feet, 3,800 meters or so, can get a little bit cold. Now I was anticipating that, but I wasn't quite anticipating how cold it gets. I climbed Mount Fuji on the last day of the climbing season, which was mid-September, and it was freezing uh, at the top. It was minus three degrees Celsius with heavy winds, some snow falling as well. And there I was with just a kind of like a thin autumn jacket, um, some a sweater underneath it, 
Um, I thankfully had some gloves. Thankfully one of the group participants had like pocket warmers that I was able to use to warm up a little bit. But I was definitely underprepared on the kind of clo clothing side. I really underestimated how cold it would get and how cold it would feel up there. So that was certainly a mistake that I did. So depending on the season that you climb Mount Fuji, I think if you climb it in peak summer in August, it is a little bit warmer, but just keep in mind that it can get very cold up there. So I'll definitely bring a hat, um, I'll definitely bring gloves and also bring, well, a thick, maybe a thicker jacket. The thing is, if you're traveling in summer, you won't be needing all of this kind of thicker clothing and all of this extra gear for the rest of your travels normally, unless you want to do some more mountain climbing. So what I did was I took all of the gear that I used for Mount Fuji, all of the boots and everything, and I went to a post office in Japan, and then I just shipped it back home. It cost me around 5,000 yen, which was 50 US dollars, and I didn't have to carry the weight with me for the rest of the trip, which continued then for another two weeks or so. So yeah, that's something that you can do if you just want to bring the gear just for Mount Fuji, then you can just send it home and it will arrive usually around the same time as you do um, if you are staying for another two weeks. So it will arrive maybe in two or three weeks afterwards. Mistake number three also comes down to preparation and again, this was something that I didn't really calculate was about food and drinks. So my assumption for some reason was that if you go to the beginning of the trail, um, we did, by the way, Mount Fuji from the on the Fuji Yoshida Trail, which is the most popular hiking trail. This starts at the fifth um, station to Mount Fuji. There are overall 13 stations to the top. And yeah, that's the most popular starting point, which is at around 1,500 meters. And I kind of assumed that at this kind of starting point, because it's very popular and a lot of people start from there, that there would be maybe a combini or kind of some other place where you can buy food and everything. But turns out there wasn't. So there were a couple of restaurants, so you can definitely eat there, but there's not that much kind of places to buy food to really bring with you. So all there was was really a souvenir store. So for the entire hike until we reached the hut where we were staying overnight, I basically had, I think it was two packets of uh, matcha flavored Kit Kat that I bought at the souvenir store, and then also two small bottles of water, I believe, that I bought for drinks. Um, I think you were able to actually refill the water, which was good. But otherwise, yeah, I was really, really, really hungry when I get to, got to the top. So that's my that's my tip number three. Also kind of has to do with preparation again. Um, that is to just bring food with you. And you can buy it in anywhere else other than the fifth station on the way to Mount Fuji. Now speaking of staying overnight in the hut, mistake number four was doing exactly that. Now this might be a little bit controversial because I know that a lot of people prefer doing it that way. So one of the main things or one of the main reasons why people climb Mount Fuji is to see the sunrise from the top of the mountain at around 5 a.m. in the summer. Um, so in order to do that, a lot of people usually start in the afternoon, the day before, maybe at around 3, maybe at around 4. This is how we did it. Um, then it takes around, I believe, seven hours, seven, maybe, depending on your pace, obviously, but like six, seven, maybe eight hours to get to the hut at, I believe, the eighth station, which is the last place where you can stay overnight. Inside this hut, you will have food, you will have a place to warm up, and you will also have beds, but it's not really, if you ever stayed in a mountain hut in Japan, you know that the beds are very tight. It feels like you are kind of sardines in a can, so we had a bed that normally would sleep maybe two people and we were five people kind of crammed up in there which was slightly uncomfortable I would say I wasn't actually able to sleep at all for that night but the whole fun experience costs uh, cost us around I believe 8,000 yen per person not including food which we also bought up there uh, which was another 1,000 yen or so and yeah without sleep then they wake you up at around 3 a.m. I believe and then you start kind of the ascent the last few hours to get to the top for sunrise. If you are a person who can sleep anywhere, like most of Japanese people are, then maybe it might be worth it because you get to warm up and you also get to, well, sleep for a couple hours at least before you make it to the top. But if you are a person who is maybe not that much of an easy sleeper, who needs, uh, who cannot sleep in an environment like this, like me, then I would recommend that which, which is also something that people do, is starting the hike a little bit later, maybe at around 6, maybe at around 7, 8 uh, p.m. 
and then just hiking all the way through basically until you reach the top which is also an option because you can do the hike at any time um, you want during the climbing season and I think that way you a save money you don't kind of waste the extra time that you need for kind of sleeping or sleeping inside these really small pots and you can also beat some people because when we did the hike the last section between the eighth station and the top was so crowded that it was it was basically like standing in queue for Disneyland and it was just so many people it, pro it probably would have been nicer to start later and then just continue all the way through and then be early at the top to also have a better spot to see the sunrise but yeah preferences are different it's up to you really I personally would not recommend doing it I would recommend just hiking through because from the 8th station to the top it's another three hours three extra hours so it's not really that far of an extra hike um, if you don't take that break at the 8th station and my last tip is to kind of manage your expectations. So there is a saying in Japan, I don't know how exactly it goes, but the saying is basically, you should definitely climb Fuji once in your lifetime, but never do it twice because it's not worth it. So it's a, it's a once in a lifetime experience. And the reason why it's not a twice in a lifetime experience is because Fuji, if you've ever seen it, the mountain, it does not have any vegetation around it. It is a very bleak, it had only mountain it only has stones um and yeah that's why you don't really have that much of an amazing how should I put it experience while climbing the mountain the views are great if it's not cloudy which is also kind of a big issue because fuji is cloudy i think it's around two thirds of the days in a year and the third where it's not cloudy are primarily in winter when the air is a lot clearer and since the climbing season is only in summer which is usually when it's hazy and also cloudy that means that um, you might get lucky and have really beautiful clear skies but in a lot of cases you will only have well clouds uh, which was also the case for us when we saw the sunrise it was partially cloudy at least it wasn't like completely um, cloud covered and like or like mist covered or fog covered but it was still kind of I don't know when I when I saw the sunrise I'm like well that's why I climbed 10 10 hours for I mean it wasn't it wasn't overwhelming it wasn't underwhelming it was kind of eh. but what was nice were the stars so the starry sky as you climb to the top if you are lucky and do not get clouds that was really beautiful um, that was probably one of the most beautiful starry sky that I've seen and having that with you while you are climbing that was also really beautiful so yeah there are good there are good sides there are bad sides to Fuji if you want to climb it try it once you probably won't um, want to do it again and I believe that Mount Fuji is best to be enjoyed from far away where you have the whole mountain in the view whether it's from an observatory tower in Tokyo whether it's somewhere in Shizuoka prefecture in Yamanashi prefecture in Kanagawa prefecture there's a lot of different beautiful viewpoints of Mount Fuji all around and yeah that's if you're on Mount Fuji you obviously can not see Mount Fuji so yeah those were five kind of mistakes that I made while climbing Mount Fuji I was underprepared in some areas over prepared in some areas I wasn't able to sleep and I also was expecting it maybe a little bit too much but yeah overall I think it was a still a cool experience to look back to it with joy and it was also kind of a thing that kicked in me the desire to do more hiking so I'm th thankful to Mount Fuji for that and yeah if you want to do Mount Fuji you will unfortunately have to wait until next year as the trails are all closed this year due to the corona crisis they are monitored by cameras they also have alarm systems if somebody tries to climb over the fence that is blocking the entrance to the trails so yeah no climbing Mount Fuji this season but next season or any season after that uh, I hope that some of these mistakes that I made were helpful for you so you can avoid them and yeah if you have any other questions about climbing Mount Fuji any of the gear I bought how to get there any kind of other question that you have around climbing Mount Fuji I'm not an expert but I can share definitely share my experience so ask them down in the comments below and as always thank you for watching hoping that the rainy season ends soon because I really want to go out hiking I want to try these new shoes that I got um, to make sure that they are really nice and yeah and yeah, if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a like. Um, if you haven't yet, consider subscribing and I will see you in the next one. See ya.